I'm, I'm going to talk, I'm going to try to get um, a little bit of the two worlds of global mental health and cultural psychiatry together. So we've heard from Vikram what global mental health stands for. Um, I see global mental health as a movement that uses mainly the vehicle, the paradigm of public mental health. So I'm going to talk quite from a public mental health angle. Um, and then I see the mental health gap program as promoted by WHO as one of the strategies, one of the tandem seeds to achieve this uh, whole <coughs> thing that we have in mind. And I'm going to talk about some challenges which I think we could either solve in maybe five or 10 years and other ch uh, challenges that may take 30 to 50 years. So um, first I'm going to mem say something about what are the goals of this global mental health movement. And then the four challenges I'm going to briefly discuss is uh, the pedigrees that global mental health is more related to social political theory and sociology and that cultural psychiatry is much more related to anthropology. Then I'm going to talk about the possible advantages of a new classification system which I think should be then DSM-6 because I think DSM-5 is a lost case. Um, and then I'm going to be a bit skeptical about uh, uh, the global mental health movement and its attempt to solve the mental health gap. And then I'm going to argue that I think we lack theory and meta-theory in our profession. So you've heard it before these days, what's global mental health about. It's about scaling up, it's about increasing coverage, it's about sustainability. And then there are five major barriers. It's the absence of funding and government commitment, there's over-centralization, there's a lack of integration of mental health care in primary care but also in chronic care systems, there's a scarcity of trained mental health personnel and a shortage of public health expertise <coughs> on all kinds of uh, system levels. Now, to, to say just briefly something about this policy of the WHO regarding the mental health gap. And what they do, and you've just seen that in the booklet this morning that you saw uh, projected twice, the blue booklet, it's focused on disorders, which I think makes sense. The WHO says, you know, we want to get rid of these vague terms of psychosocial issues and mental health issues. Let's go for concrete disorders, even though they're a bit vague but they're quite universally kind of proven. Um, I regret that they choose that way to some extent because I think it opens very much the, the way to a medical discourse and it opens the way which I think in many low-income countries is a major, major problem that you get into a medical discourse and you get into a mental health system that talks about psychiatry. You talk about mental health systems that always start with building a psychiatric hospital. That psychiatric hospital is always too big, it always has too many beds. Um, it absorbs most of the funding. The few psychiatrists in many of these countries, they then work in this hospital. There's no funding left, no manpower left to go into the communities and to do what we all think that should be done, is to deinstitutionalize these hospitals, etc. And then besides, another problem is because the psychiatric hospital absorbs so much money, there is uh, very little funding for the psychiatrists to go into this community, so they have to do private practice and to survive. So they often do two hours in the morning in the psychiatric hospital, and in the afternoon they do fancy psychotherapies that they have learned somewhere in academia. And many academicians in these countries are, about, are in the same kind of realm, so that's one of my regrets of the discourse the WHO has chosen, although I understand the rationale behind it. Now, this is a slide explaining why, why I like this concept of public mental health. If you look at all the studies on psychotherapy, they show that about 30% of the effect of psychotherapy is the universal therapist variables. We discussed it this morning. Then we spend, most of us, we spend many, many years of learning all these different schools of psychotherapy, but they explain explained on only 15% of the variants. What we learn very little in academia is how to deal with these contextual variables that explain 40% of all the effect 
or therapy. And that's what public mental health is about. It's about these variables, because public mental health is the social action to promote and restore mental health. So that's a reason that we like that paradigm. Then, on other system levels, there is a problem of lack of professionals, and I'll get back to that in a minute. And then, this is compounded in areas of political violence and disasters and other issues that you'll see here. Now, everything that's light green on this map means there's a very limited amount of mental health professionals. So if you look, you remember uh, Lawrence's slide this morning of the, the yellow with the dallies, you see that the concentration of the dallies is in this area of Africa. And most of these countries, they have three clinical psychologists, they have 10 psychiatric nurses, they have one or two psychiatrists or no psychiatrists. And so you see a belt over the world from the east to the west with very low numbers of mental health professionals. The D's are the areas where there often are disasters. The PP's is where there's political violence. So on the one hand, you see a whole range of social determinants and predictors of political violence and war that concentrate in, these, in this broad light green band. But many of these social determinants that predict war are also the social determinants that predict health in general and that predict mental health problems. So it's a accumulation of stresses and problems. Now let's look at the treatment gap in times of peace. Uh, Vikram showed this morning about 50% in high income countries is treated. According to some people, that's even too optimistic. Some people say in high income country treats about 30% of the people who need treatment get treatment. In low income countries it may be as low as 3%. Um, and that applies both to adults and children as the Lancet series has shown. And in times of peace there's beneficiary factors that play a role that we all have to deal with. It's the expression of psychopathology pathology in terms of the, 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 the Diagnosis we often use. People use different explanatory models. They, they express their, their uh, suffering in spiritual, religious, family, or community terms, and the providers often belong to different social economic groups or they come from the cities. And then in post disaster areas where there's political violence or disasters, the problem is even bigger. There are few, fewer resources in terms of infrastructure, human resources, policies. They're even less professionals, e either because they leave the country, like in Algeria, Iraq, or Afghanistan, or because of genocide, like in Cambodia and Rwanda. The delivery models that I use are often not fit to the local culture, either because they come from colonial times or they are important from other countries. The psychologists have little training in psychotherapy and in trauma-focused therapy, like in China and Algeria, and survivors, they often uh, live in the rural areas and the intellectuals that are supposed to kind of involve something to, to go to these communities, they come from other areas. So, now do we only talk about low and middle income countries? If you look at high income countries, some of them, they close the treatment gap. When I take my own country, the Netherlands, we only have 17, 17 million inhabitants. But you have more mental health professionals than India, and we have more uh, mental health professionals than China, with population that's 75 times bigger. <laughs> did we solve our problem? No, we didn't. Of these 17 million people, 1 million get treatment for depression, which is nice because it exactly there is no treatment gap anymore. You look at the prevalence rates in the Netherlands, and you look at the, 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 the amount of people that get psychotherapy or SSRIs, that is there's no treatment gap anymore. It solved the treatment gap. Of these five barriers that I mentioned in the beginning, we solved them all. We have the highest expenditure on mental health in the world. According to some, it's 11%. According to others, it's 23%. In contrast with many low- and middle-income countries that spend one-fourth or one-half percent of their budget on mental health. So we spend the money. There is no much not so much st stigma anymore. <coughs> Many people, they speak very openly about going into psychotherapy. In the university, professors, they say, going into psychotherapy, 
of politicians. They talk on the radio. They say, you know, I have a child with a mental handicap. And they're very open about that, that it's even used in their campaigns. So all these five barriers, because they're also human beings, that's the message. So all these five barriers, we solve them. But still, we have a big problem. We have the highest bed density in the world with Germany. Uh, England has 50% of a bed uh, density. But many of income, low income countries, they have only one bed for 100,000 inhabitants, and we have 130. And they do as good as we do with one bed for 100,000 inhabitants. So we have a big problem there. And then of the one million people who get antidepressants, there's about 600,000 of them who shouldn't get antidepressants because they have a mild depression. So there's enormous overtreatment. And we were happy that we trained our GPs to recognize depression and to treat it. So when we talk about global mental health, I mean global in the sense it involves also high income countries because we don't have our act together. We have many means and possibilities, but we haven't solved <coughs> our problems. Okay, let me get to the challenges. The first one is that we have different pedigrees, global mental health and culture psychiatry. Culture psychiatry thrives on localized phenomena and critique of, the global of global mental health. And global mental health thrives on group phenomena, on assessments and epidemiology. Mm -hmm. But global mental health very much needs culture psychiatry and, and anthropology, and we've discussed it these days, to provide meaning, to adapt and translate our instruments, to deal with validity issues, both with semantic validity, with construct validity, with conceptual validity, with content validity, with technical validity. Um, we have talked about the category fallacy. Um, we need anthropology to develop mixed methods because epidemiology without anthropology and without other disciplines doesn't make sense. And even the delis that we have discussed several times today, the delis are not carved in stone. We need anthropology to interpret the delis, because the delis don't say anything about the impact of gender, the impact of age, the impact of culture, the impact of duration of, 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 of a problem. It doesn't say anything about the impact on the community, on the family, or on the comorbidity of physical and mental disease. So to interpret delis, you need, again, social science. I think it's a bit problematic that global mental health and culture psychiatry that we tend to very much stay within the boundaries of our fields. There's many adjacent disciplines, social science, social psychology, health systems, research, neurobiology, or for example, the very beautiful studies and the very beautiful methodologies that have been developed into culture psychology that we know very little about. So there's a whole group of studies in, in culture psychology with very refined uh, cross-cultural methods that few of us know and I think we should get much more into these other disciplines to enrich our field. The second challenge is a very distal challenge. It's if we would ha get a new classification system as it's now being discussed, going from categorical binary classification to a dimensional would that help us? I think it would help us to enrich both fields because it would facilitate assessment of the seriousness of complaints, the monitoring of a mental health program. It would uh, help us to take illness behavior uh, response bias in, into account in doing our work because it would kind of give us a margin within which we can look at seriousness, we can look at the duration of complaints, etc. Second, it would also show the relativity of the relativity of the distinction between subsyndromal symptom categories and idioms of distress. So, what we are now very often dealing with is where, where is this a diagnosis? Isn't this a diagnosis? Does it fit the local culture? Does the local culture preferably express the problem in an idiom of distress? So, it would help us to see who is doing what within that public mental health system. It would also help us to see the gradual transition from normalcy to deviancy. It would help us to solve these perennial dilemmas we are struggling with when we do epidemiology about cut-off points, about root questions, about 
validity discussions and all the issues that are related to that, the skewed prevalence rates and cross-cultural contacts. Still, uh, with, 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 uh, with his colleagues in Australia, they did this, this paper, this beautiful meta-analysis of human rights violations, and then they find figures of PTSD that go from 0 to 90% of depression, of 0 to 85% in, in a few hundred studies around the world in human, where there's torture and human rights violations. And then you wonder, what do these epidemiological figures, what do they, what, what do they tell us? And how do they help us to do whatever uh, in addition to publishing in a journal? Okay, a new system might help us to find higher order constructs and, and, and spectra. Uh, we have been discussing these days about the impossibility of depression and anxiety as two different diagnoses. Most patients have both, most symptoms overlap in many studies. It's the same neurophysiological systems in the brain being uh, affected. It's the same uh, pills that we use to, to, to treat them. And it's the same research instruments that you often can use to measure depression or anxiety or vice versa. So Horwich, many people, they've shown that it's in fact an untenable thing to continue with these diagnoses. So if you would have a spectrum where you would say, well, there is one, spectrum disorder for that combines a depression and anxiety, it would also mean that primary care workers in low-income countries don't have to deal with these 300 and plus diagnoses that we have. So that would make the task shifting and the task sharing that we like so much, that would make it much more easy. It would also help us to reduce false positive and false negative rates, this perennial discussion on schizophrenia that we have among immigrants, etc where uh, we more and more find that it's all debate that it might have to do a lot with, in fact, wrong diagnosis, although there's much more to that, and maybe you're going to say something more about it later on. I think another advantage is that a limited number of spectra will also help us to get to more basic and simpler forms of psychotherapy, because we now have all these protocols for all these little sub-diagnoses we all have to learn these protocols, but if we would get to a kind of a modular treatment, cognitive behavioral therapy, it would, and again, facilitate having that kind of work being done by primary care workers in low-income countries without raising too many uh, ethical problems. And then the fifth one, um, I think if we would go, if we make real big steps in doing social and neuro, uh, cultural neurobiological research, I think uh, it may show us one day that there are very different biologies around the world, as Chow and other people have shown this. Culture molds the brain like the brain molds culture, so that we don't assume anymore that we have one brain as a universal constant and that culture is only an epiphenomenon, so that we really are able to say, well, why would we want at all to continue with one system for, res for diagnose all around the world, which I think at the end is, 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 is a, a bad idea. But we still try to do that. So it means that you may still have, you still have a group of psychosis, but that psychosis, that same group of psychosis, may look very different in different parts of the world. But I don't know whether it's going to happen, and if it's going to happen, probably it takes about 30, 40 years. Okay, the third challenge is um, about collaboration in addressing the mental health gap. So I think the, the, the global mental health movement is sometimes is a, it's a bit uh, optimistic, although I think it's a very important movement, it's innovative, it has a law, um, in the sense that it is innovative that it mobilizes groups, but it's in my view not innovative in terms of what has been written before about mental health to primary care or, or in terms of how to do public mental health. It has some invalidated assumptions, which I will describe in the paper you'll see later. We are dealing very often in this global mental health movement with failing governments that know very well what to do, but they are inert or they don't act. That's not only in mental health, it's in, in global health in general. It's with infectious disease and non-infectious disease. Um, and I think we need much more collaboration, and we've been discussing that these days very often. 
That's a luxurious five minutes. I'm almost done. Um, we have been discussing it these days that idioms of distress there are hundreds or thousands of local expressions of distress. It's often the realm of the healers. Idioms of distress, they are not, let's say, they are not, they are, they are, they are not the victim of a classification system. It's the local expression that often where, where, let's say, depression and anxiety and traumatic stress and other symptoms, they <coughs> overlap. They make sense. They have meaning within that local culture. They have salience. When people communicate with these idioms, everybody knows what you're talking about. When you talk about depression, people say, I don't know what it is. When you talk about anxiety disorder, people may say, I don't know what it is. But an idiom of stress makes sense. And that's what people take to healers before they get to the mental health services. And since we have so few of these mental health professionals, as this WHO slide showed, and since we have so many of these healers in the world, because most cultures have one in 200 or one in 500 of the population worldwide is a healer. Whether you go to the Philippines or India or you go to Latin America or Africa or Montreal, or Montreal <laughs> huh? then it's very amazing that we don't talk more about how we relate to them. Huh? We have been discussing we don't need to collaborate if we don't want, we don't need to cooperate, them, but we, we somehow could interact and relate to them because it's very important. It's important for our patients. It's important for if we want to do global mental health or if we want to set up a public mental health program because you can't do public mental health if you don't know the group explanatory models of the people you're working with. So you have to get into these issues in order to do your thing. That's at least my opinion. Okay, my last slide is that, um, so what's driving global mental health? Um, and I don't know what's driving global mental health, except from our enthusiasm, and we know how important it is when we look at the dailies. Um, does it need theory? You may argue, well, we don't need theory because, you know, public mental health and public health is not about theory. Public health means you have a group of people, and they, do, they work together, and they try to improve the health of a population. That's public health. Or you may say, well, you don't need theory because in public health there are health economists, there are anthropologists, there are sociologists, there are psychiatrists and doctors and public health experts. So why would you need more theory than the theories that all these different disciplines bring into the game when you are involved in public health or public mental health? Well, um, I think it's a big issue that we don't have theory. And I think we have to develop theory together. Because the things we are doing, there's a kind of loose end. Uh, I don't know how to say that in English. It's a, it's a loose construction. There's building blocks, but there's no cement between the blocks. And uh, I've been reading over the past month, I've been reading a couple of papers and books uh, that were very hard for me to understand. But I looked into evolutionary biology and mathematical biology. And then you look at the very sophisticated methodological, mathematical and computer models they have developed in looking at biology and how you get from the primordial soup to microbes and then to evolution, etc. And then not taking only Darwinian princi principles of mutation and selection, but then much more important than these two Darwinian principles, the issues of cooperation and super cooperation. And then I must say I'm really impressed about what these people have achieved and how they, they look at a very complex level at what's happening and how people can cooperate and collaborate. And I think cooperation and collaboration is very important when you look at things like stigma or when you look at reaching the communities or working within the communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as the last sentence says, maybe this is just a very naive fantasy I have, who knows? And again, if that might happen in a field, it'll take a long time. Okay, this is what I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention.